Let me make a bold statement here. It might anger and ruffle a few nerd feathers. You don't really know web app development or app development until you've developed an app, taken it to market, gotten feedback, refactored, refined, and then made money with that app or at least been in part of a team that's gone through that process where you've seen the app go from inception to actual functional use with the end user. Whether you have a commercial SaaS like myself that's being used by schools and individuals, or maybe you work in a very large organization where you have an app that's being developed for internal department use. To really understand web app development or app development in general, you have to go through this process from inception to deployment to refactoring to refinement and version one, version two, version three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In my estimation, you're gonna see a huge improvement and a huge amount of changes from version one of your app to version four of your app. Major changes, major iterations. It's pretty profound. When you get beyond that, the slope of change begins to diminish with some, uh, with some exceptions. So let's look at some huge examples. If you look at um, Mac OS, Mac OS, you know, version 7, 8, 9, something like that, very similar. When they hit 10, that was a huge revamp. That, they, they went from the old, I think it was Pascal-based operating system, and they went to Unix-based or free, with free BSD for Mac OS 10. That was a huge change. But for several iterations, several version numbers before, Mac OS was very, very similar. It was re refinement stages. And you'll see that with iOS, you see that with Android. You have a release, you have several iterations or several versions where it's just refinement, refinement, refinement. And then occasionally, once every five or 10 years, you see a big change that happens. So yeah, when you are a developer, you have to expect, if you, if you become a professional developer, that you have to go through many iterations. And you don't really understand the game of development until you actually get in the real world, you start developing apps for real clients where you have deadlines and you have to get things out on time and you don't have time to do the perfect academic implementation. I see a lot of that on YouTube or elsewhere where you know, clearly I can tell, I know, it's not a big secret, I can tell but a lot of these ideas being put forth by young nerdlings, noobs, noob nerdlings is that you know, they come up with these ideas they, they read in an article, which was written by an academic who actually never did anything, but he read it from somebody else who actually never did anything in the real world. And they come up with these crazy ideas about, you know, purity of code or purity of implementation. It doesn't work that way. Then people like me, crusty old 269-year-old nerds such as myself, who have actually written commercial software and taken it to market, and understand the way things go, we look at that and go, eh. if you look at videos in this channel, this YouTube channel, you see that. You see I'll, I'll, I made these statements before in different videos and different variations of, of the same theme. And uh, highly experienced developers, people tell me they have 15, 20 years experience, they say, yeah, 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 we've seen this before. This is the way it works. That's just the way it is. So there you go, in uh, the tradition of this channel of delivering experiential, if that's a word, experience-based developer insights, this is a big one. This is a big one. And so uh, I hope it clarifies, I hope it gives you an idea of what the real world is like in terms of development. So it's encouraging. Don't worry about making mistakes. B, don't expect that uh, your first iteration of your code and your software is gonna be perfect. It will never be perfect. Now you know a strategy. Get your app out as quickly as possible. Don't waste your time with uh, a perfect implementation. It's just a waste of time. Get it out, get it out, get it out. For example, with Studio Web, we're on version four. This is uh, eight years into it. Uh, after many years, I pulled the trigger on the rewrite about a year and a half ago. So what I did is I got my new lead developer involved and I had him work on the previous version of Studio Web, the, the, the first version, which was up to version three. 
and it was based on a very old framework called Cold Igniter. And I had him work on that for about six months so that he became very familiar with the use case. He understand how the data had to flow, the database data. So this would allow him to be a much better developer, lead developer and uh, architect of, uh, of the new version because he, he would know where the bottlenecks were, he would know uh, where the data had to go and what had to come in quickly, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that makes sense. So, of course, I, I architect everything, but he, after six months of work on the EOS system, he could sit down with me and we could work out the structure in terms of database, in terms of the, uh, the business layer architecture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, data access layer, data access architecture. So that we had a, a far more optimized code base for the use case that Studio Web ha has, right? So that's a very important thing. So we waited, well, I waited several years. And then when I felt it was that the old code base could no longer be massaged and extended, its life extended, I pulled the trigger on a brand new rewrite from scratch. And that was the main point for Studio Web 4, by the way. Studio Web 4's main point, main point of rewrite was to take advantage of new technologies and to architect from scratch uh, a system that was accountable, if you will, that was cognizant of what the underlying use case was and data structures were. Because when we first designed Studio Web, when I designed it, I did not conceive of certain things that came to pass. So I was uh, uh, lax on certain aspects of the database structure. I was lax in terms of uh, the business layer because I didn't really know precisely what was going to happen in terms of how it was going to be used by people and what features they would want. So when we developed the first version, we launched it. And I would have to say I was about maybe 50 to 60% there, maybe 60, 65% of the way there in terms of capabilities, in terms of what I understood. But as we got more and more feedback from people, more and more feedback from schools and other institutions, we started adding features on there. It became pretty messy because, you know, when a school calls you up in a panic, we need this, this, and that, and this, and that, and that, you don't have time to, to start... Um, refactoring your old code base and restructuring data because you got live users. So you have to add a patch without disturbing the current uh, uh, set of users on there. It's a bit of a messy process, but that's okay because I developed my software from experience going back to the 90s. I developed my software with the expectations that once a code base in terms of its use case is refined, once we have a refined understanding of the use case, that's better. Then we can say, okay, we're good. This is pretty stable in terms of what we know the app needs to do, given our client base, given what the use case is. Then we can go, okay, fine. Let's now redesign from scratch with that really deep understanding of how the system should work. And then you design from scratch. So now the new Studio Web 4 is far superior. And uh, it's far superior because, A, we know exactly how the system should work. So I was able to design the database and et cetera, et cetera, accordingly. Also, you know, it's just a fact of life. You know, much newer, uh, much better frameworks we're utilizing, better ORM, better MVC framework, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there you go. That's uh, my long-term experience of developing a commercial app for eight years now, building, maintaining, redesigning, refactoring, and uh, deploying in a commercial sense. You don't really know development until you've gone through that process. You don't really know what you're doing. Doing a couple of tutorials and so on, doesn't, it's just the beginning. You know, you do your foundations, one or two tutorials, then you gotta get out there in the real world with deadlines, with clients, having to maneuver. It's, uh, it's like jazz, it's like playing jazz. You know, if you uh, play karaoke where you just sing somebody else's song, that doesn't make you a musician. But if you're uh, a jazz player, like a jazz drummer or a jazz player where you just improvise as you go and the band flows with the, uh, uh, with the you know, as the music flows, um, that's software development in many respects. It's about being, having the chops and having the capability to adjust 
uh, according to the needs of the project at hand. All right, let's end off this video with part two. So I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a highly experienced developer and a uh, published author with O'Reilly, which is probably the most prestigious uh, tech publisher in the world. And um, he owned a web development studio where they principally did their development in Ruby and Rails. Anyway, so I asked him, I said, why do you think Ruby, in your opinion, and this is from a, a guy who loves Ruby, I said, why do you think Ruby lost its mojo? Because at one point in time, Ruby was the hot language. Go back seven years ago, whatever it was, you know, Ruby was it. Ruby was it. And uh, it was interesting. He said, the, what killed Ruby was the snake. Yes, the snake, the Python killed Ruby. And why did Python kill Ruby? Well, there was always a rivalry between Python and Ruby, by the way. There's always a bit of a rivalry because they were both kind of perceived as being in a, a similar space, if you will. There are differences, trust me, between the languages, but they were considered pretty similar um, in some respects in terms of uh, the, the readability of the code and so on. Anyway, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. The main reason that Python According to my friend, and I, I believe it's true, pushed out Ruby is because Python has a, a huge advantage in terms of AI and ML, machine learning, data sciences, big data processing, all this kind of stuff. Python is the king there. Ruby, you can do it Ruby, but they, they don't have much of a footprint in that regard. So much in the same way or in the same thinking, if you will, of no developers to say, well, if we're going to have to write JavaScript on the client with Vue or React or just you know, vanilla JavaScript, we might as well write JavaScript on the server and get into Node besides the certain advantages that Node has. So when developers and companies are looking at the stacks that they're going to develop, it, develop in, they realize that, uh, well, at least their perception is rather, is that since we're going to have to be writing Python anyway for our machine learning or AI, we might as well use Python on the web client too, right? Why introduce, why have Ruby, why have PHP if we're going to be getting into AI machine learning or we're going to be getting into that kind of stuff? We might as well just do it all, P, all Python and save ourselves a headache. You know, that's his reasoning why Ruby got killed by Python, or, or at least beaten down quite a bit. And uh, he may be right about that. Personally, I think that it's overblown to be concerned about what languages you use, because if you know how to program, for you, if you're a Python expert, to you to jump into Ruby would take you, you know, a few days and you're gonna get your head wrapped around Ruby, right? So, of course, Ruby people say, well, yeah, Ruby Rails is far better than Django. It might be, but again, something I've said over and over again, the difference in quality between Rails and Django and Laravel, it ain't much. And uh, here's my phone. Yellow. Hey. Hey, what's going on? That agent called me back. 